ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce the team to you. From right to left, uh, we have uh, Dr. Kim Linsenmeyer. She is a research associate with the University of Bochum. And Kim, happy birthday. Today is Kim's birthday, so please uh, join me in congratulating her. In the middle, we have Dr. Sasha Alavi, who is a full professor of sales at the University of Bochum in Germany. And my name is Johannes Abel. I'm an associate professor with the University of Bochum. Our paper was inspired by the fact that in sales, we can see somewhat of a burnout crisis. So sales seems to be a particularly stressful pos uh, position. Some statistics say that up to 70% of salespeople um, regularly experience burnout in their daily lives. This is nicely encapsulated in this quote right here, the stress that salespeople experience. I have to sell. I have to bring money in the door. And if I don't, people are going to lose their jobs. I might lose my job. My bills might not get paid. So sales particularly stressful. The question that we ask in our research is, what is the role of compensation plans in inducing these levels of stress that might lead to burnout and actually manifest in health problems? A lot of salespeople, typically salespeople, are compensated, including variable compensation meaning they don't get their full salary um, as a fixed compensation, but they only get a certain percentage as fixed compensation. And then the rest they get as variable compensation, depending on their achievement of sales targets. The logic for this kind of compensation is pretty intuitive, uh, which is, well, if I promise a salesperson a variable compensation share, meaning you only get a certain percentage of your, uh, of your compensation if you achieve sales targets, well, this is going to motivate the salesperson to work harder, to strive for the carrot, uh, which at the end of the day is going to increase sales performance. So at the end of the day, both the company gets, gets what the company wants, which is a high sales performance, and the salesperson gets what the salesperson wants, which arguably is a high salary. Um, and prior research shows that this chain works out beautifully. So variable compensation does motivate salespeople to work harder. But what we want to examine in, in this research um, is whether there is also a downside to variable compensation plans. Because variable compensation, of course, also entails consider considerable compensation uncertainty. Um, so if you have a high variable compensation share and a lot of salespeople have shares of 80%, for example, you might, uh, you might, if you don't sell, get 500 bucks a month as fixed salary, and that's it. So you might not be ab even able to pay your rent. So you constantly have this pressure of performing, compensation uncertainty, and arguably this could induce stress for salespeople, which could manifest in burnout and even in um, health problems. Now, if variable compensation has this downside and induces health problems, then it might be that there is also a negative effect on sales performance. So maybe this was the onset of our research project. It's not just the case that variable compensation motivates and thereby increases sales performance, but maybe there is a dark side to variable compensation, which is that it causes health problems, which then decrease sales performance. We um, conducted three studies to test this proposition, and uh, my colleague Sasha Lavi is going to lead us through our results. Yes, uh, thanks to you so much, Johannes. Um, right, uh, I got the remote control now, so let's um, go to the studies that we've conducted. In the first study, uh, I have to say we had the unique opportunity um, to, to follow and observe an incentive change in a big company where we had the opportunity that the company changed the compensation plan in one of the major divisions while in a comparable similar division the um, compensation system remained unchanged so um, how did this change of the incentive scheme look like before um, the change it was a very high powered incentive scheme with 80 percent of um, variable share of compensation as fixed in the work contracts and it was really a radical change, as you can see here, because they changed it to a really a fixed compensation plan with 80% fixed compensation. And we um, estimated a set of difference in difference um, models to, to, um, to find out the average treatment effect and the results in some were um, as, as follows. We find that 
indeed, as we as like conventional theory would predict, that sales performance decreased to the due to this incentive change. But at the same time, also like confirming our expectations that verbal compensation might really affect health, as Johannes just explained. Also, the number of sick days taken, which we took objectively from the company data plans, also decreased, indicating that indeed there is a trade off between sales performance, which is enhanced by the verbal compensation due to the motivational effect that Johannes described, but also that there's a different logic that we need to be aware of as, as of our scientists, but also uh, as foreign practitioners that verbal compensation can harm uh, employees' health, especially mental health. And while we saw in this study that in total, the effect on performance was stronger, still the health detriments really impaired the beneficial effects of verbal compensation. But we wanted to, because we were really intrigued by this result, we wanted to dive, dive deeper into this relationship between verbal compensation and health. So we conducted more studies. We are just reporting you two, but we did a couple of more as some you might know. And we wanted to explore the shape of the relationship between verbal compensation share and mental health. And we, we saw an intriguing pattern of results that indeed the verbal compensation share only enhanced the, or um, um, afflicted mental health in specific circumstances. To be more precise, only after specific levels of verbal compensation share we, we observed an increasingly harmful effect of, this, of those high-powered incentives on mental health. In our studies, the, the, this threshold that we identified was approximately between the range of 30 to 40% verbal compensation share. But moreover, of course, it's important to differentiate this relationship across different conditions. And we saw that only for specific salespeople segments, this um, harmful relationship, what we call J-shaped relationship um, occurred. This was that for sales people who are like in a way vulnerable because they have unstable performance or perfor high, highly stable performers. Um, as you can see in the green curve, the curve is flat. Verbal compensation share does not um, induce um, or, or harm mental health. Also for experienced sales people, sales people who have like strong social resource because they're embedded in, in well-functioning teams or because they have a good relationship with the leader. For such salespeople, there was not a, an association between share verbal compensation and, um, and uh, stress or burnout. So where does that leave us now? What implications can we draw from this, uh, from, from these results that we uncovered? First of all, Sales managers have a responsibility, in our view, to manage and cope also instead of for, for, uh, for salespeople with those potentially harmful effects. So already when screening and hiring new salespeople, they need to the screen the candidates for the skills and factors that can protect them against the potentially harmful winds or influences. But of course, um, this is not always the case. Um, uh, that, that you can screen in advance and selectively hire. So you need to um, empower the employees by providing resources, the social resources, um, experience, stabilizing their performance to counter this potentially harmful effects of variable compensation shares. And eventually also like different research from ours indicated that really tailoring the compensation plan to the salespeople's individual needs and preferences can be a really viable way to counter um, the harmful effects of share verbal compensation. Now, lo looking at this maybe from a bigger view perspective as was really like the, 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 the one of the key um, objectives of the special issue is, yeah, what is the bigger picture seeing those results? And what we observe quite clearly is that in more and more societal areas, major societal areas, as you can see here in the pictures, 
for example, in journalism, even medicine, or also for university professors. Variable compensation schemes are growing more and more prevalent. And not only are there the potentially dangerous, harmful effects related to health, but also we know there are studies showing that they can afflict quality of work. And one, maybe one very interesting question for discussion beyond looking at the commercial sales context and other contexts where the, those incentive schemes are prevalent is, do we want in our major social, social societal areas as medicine, university or journalism, incentive schemes which can have really like a dark side and detrimental effect which we to date do not fully comprehend yet as I, as I fear. Okay, um, I think uh, this bigger <laughs> view questions conclude our presentation. We are very excited and thankful to be here and we're looking forward to discuss this with you. Thank you. Hello from Vancouver, everybody. My name is Yan Wen. Taxes, public usage restrictions and anti-smoking ads. We call that the three counter marketing mix across different cigarette brands. So this is a paper. This is a joint paper with my amazing advisors, Michael Lewis from Emory and Michelle Singh from NYU. And for today's talk, Mike and me will share some of a quick overview of this study. So what is counter-marketing, okay? So counter-marketing actually has been increasingly used in these days, trying to reduce the consumption of vice goods, such as cigarettes. And there are three different kinds of counter-marketing mix when it comes to anti-smoking advertising. And as you can see here on this slide, it includes cigarette excise taxes that elevates the consumption cost. And as you can see here, between 2006 and 2010, there has been, a, I would say, tremendous increase. And the biggest jump actually happened in the middle of 2009 when the federal tax increased by 39 cents in the United States. And the other jumps correspond to several like statewide taxes that happened during the period. In addition to this, we also have smoke-free restriction that has been going more stringent over time in pink. Okay, and what you see here is the different level of variation over public venues. And the very last is the anti-smoking ads. It's on and off during this observation window period. And they are believed to be quite successful. As you can see here from the very top corner, like the average consumption rate per month has been steadily dropped from above 20 packs per month to about 10 packs. So there is no wonder they work. Okay. However, another phenomenon for this counter-marketing campaign is usually a prominent feature of a lot of vice categories is they are dominated by super or big brands, including, for example, Marlboro, Coca-Cola, and McDonald's. And when I mention those brands, and I believe at least some of you will be like me, there's vivid image popping up in your mind, like Marlboro Man and Polar Bear Happiness, and also Uncle McDonald's. So this is how successful their marketing campaign has been worked in the past decades or more than past decades. But right now we're talking about disrupting consumer brand relationships. And if you look at the economic or public health literatures, um, they kind of ignored the role of brands. And this could be a clear oversight as public policy is trying right, to <clears throat> trying to limit brand advertising. And we have some preliminary evidence to show that it seems the counter-marketing campaigns have a symmetric role across brands. And here, what you're seeing is across all, almost every state in the United States, there is a steady increase in tax between 2006 and 2010. And what you see in blue is actually the sheer of market Marlboro changes over time. What you can realize is across almost every state, the share of Marlboro increased at different levels, but they always increase. So that leads to our research question. Do the effects of the three counter marketing mix going to have a symmetric effect across brands? Okay, so we try to understand that whether and why, and we explore a reason from two sides, one from the supply side and the other from the demand side. On the supply side, 
we ask the question whether $1 increase in cigarette taxes would translate into $1 increase in cigarette prices. Okay, it might sound like a very natural question, sure, but what we find from empirical data is not necessarily. What we do is to regress the weekly brand specific cigarette prices per pack on tax rates, and we allow the effect to vary across different brands. Of course, we also controlled for brand store and year fixed effect. What do we find? We find Marlboro has the lowest pass through, which means for every $1 increase in cigarette taxes per pack, this would only translate into 92 cents increase in Marlboro's prices. However, compared to the other brands, other brands would experience at least $0.94, 94 cents increase or maybe $1.10. So why? Okay, excise tax pass through rates are likely to be determined jointly on brand and retail strategy. Strong brands like Marlboro may have a deeper pocket to cut margins and absorb some of the tax hikes and thus avoid losing sales volumes. Meanwhile, retailers may wish to minimize pass through for those category leaders to avoid losing overall volume. That means strong brands like Marlboro could be more resilient to tax hikes, which is one of the most important counter marketing mix. Okay, so that is our explanation from the supply side. And at the same time, we also, of course, explore the demand side response, that is consumers' reaction to the three counter marketing mix. On the demand side, we build a structural model trying to study the varying effects of the three counter marketing mix on three consumer decisions, whether they buy cigarettes and which brand or which set of brands do they buy and how many packs of each brand do they buy. So when we understand all the three questions, we can answer, for example, when we see 100% tax increase, or when we see the maximum smoke-free restriction in the real world, what is going to happen? And what do we find? We find very interesting, or we think very interesting patterns. We find strong brands like Marlboro, they are more resilient to tax hikes because of the lower pass-through rates. However, they actually would experience more reduction when there is a maximum smoke-free restriction. Why? Okay. We think like for strong brands, right? When people smoke, People smoke for different, oh, when they quit smoking, <laughs> there are different mechanisms involved. When you increase tax hikes, you elevate the economic cost. It's less effective for strong brands consumption, okay? But when you try to remove the ability to consume the product in public venues, you actually remove the value of strong brands. That's why strong brands like Marlboro are get hurt more. And think about like uh, Marlboro, right? Those are the Marlboro men cool image. And let's not ignore the fact teenagers start smoking because it's hard to escape the images of skinny supermodels puffing away on cigarettes. So this is our explanation. Actually, right? The two different mechanisms, the two different counter marketings are tackling different mechanisms of smoking or quit smokings. It's important to consider the brand value of strong brands. So these are our overall key takeaway of this studies. Of course, there are many others, but we think those two are the most important parts. So this study fusing the gap in the literature and shows that how strong brands may impact the efficacy of the three different counter marketing mix. And they're more resilient to tax increase but they actually get affected more when you're trying to remove the visual elements of smoking. Mm -hmm. And what are the implications for a better world outcomes? We believe at least there are three folds, including the policy implications, consumer welfare, and brand management. And now, like my co-author, Mike Lewis, are going to talk, give you more of our implications. Thank you, Yanwen. You know, when I, when I think about sort of the big picture on this, I, I often come back to where we started. And where we started on this project was actually from a very CRM perspective. 
Um, and, and, you know, marketers have been interested in CRM for decades and this idea of how do you build up, how do you build up strong brands? Um, but there are often occasions, increasing numbers of occasions where there's, there's stakeholders that want to disrupt these strong brands. So th this project's genesis was really in this idea of sort of reverse engineering CRM. So when I think of the implications for the better world, yeah, sure, we've got definite recommendations related to the types of nudges that you might wanna do. And, and I think the, the nudges are very logical, right? If something's a strong brand, you want to make it difficult for people to reveal that brand, to show that brand, to remove the possibility of acting as a badge brand. Um, if you do a tax uh, hike, that's obviously gonna be very effective, but maybe the strong brands are gonna be resilient because there's lower price sensitivity for those brands. Um, now, the, the other thing that I, I always come back to on this is when you start to think about the third stakeholder in this and the brand management implications, and this is where I think it gets sort of very interesting when we start to think about perhaps how, what is a vice good, and look, we, we started this with Coca-Cola, you know, sort of a, a sugary soda, a high fat fast food at McDonald's and cigarettes. I, th I think there's different levels of debate about how harmful those products are. And, and so, and I think if we're honest, the, the, the products that are considered vice goods often move around over time. And, and so, you know, we, we, we're tr what we're trying to do here is both provide some guidance in terms of the nudges policymakers might want to do, but also some guidance to brand management that may find themselves you know, a little bit under the gun here. Um, now, th this issue of, uh, you know, sort of the, the breadth of brands that are categories that might find itself sort of subject to counter-marketing, I, I think is sort of the right place for, frame, for framing where this research may go in the, in the future. And when we start talking about cigarettes, I think it's very clear that, uh, or sort of the, 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 the number of people, the percentage of the population that view cigarettes as harmful is overwhelming. Right. But as you move to other categories, say fast foods or soda or gambling or firearms, there may be significant differences in the population. And so part of what we also come to this is this question about, let's say, boundary issues. And so given that there are different levels of public uh, distrust or public ill will towards a category, how will our findings actually translate to how, how will our findings, findings actually translate to different categories? And I think that's where we actually want to leave things for now. Thank you. So first of all, thank you everyone for coming today um, to the session and the organizers. This is an, a wonderful initiative and I'm really excited to be a part of this forum. Um, my name is Nicole Robitaille. I'm an assistant professor of marketing at the Smith School of Business at Queens University. Um, and I'm really excited to share our work on increasing organ donor registrations with behavioral interventions, a field um, experiment with you today. This work was conducted with a wonderful team of co-authors um, that I'm really excited um, to have had the opportunity to work with on this project. Um, so this work was done um, in collaboration with Nina Mazar at Boston University, Claire Sai at the University of Toronto, Avery Haviv at the University of Rochester, and Elizabeth Hardy with the Government of Canada. Um, and this work really started with this question um, based on this large need for donors. So when we look at the US, currently there's over 107,000 individ individuals um, on the wait list. Every nine minutes, another um, name is added to the wait list and 17 individuals die on average every day waiting um, for a transplant. In Canada, we have a much smaller population, um, but the numbers are equally alarming. So um, there's over 4,400 people on the in the wait list in Canada 1600 are added annually and every year more than 250 um, of these individuals will die waiting and the problem is a growing problem we see over time the number of people who need transplants and need donors is growing much faster than the number of donors is growing so the problem is growing um, so how do we resolve this well one of the ways is to increase the number of people who are registered um, as donors and one of the, the solutions that's received a lot of attention lately is, well, maybe we should just change the policy default. Um, in North America, you have to opt in. You have to sign up to be an organ donor. What if instead we changed the default to 
um, everybody's registered and you, you have the option to opt out. Um, but when we look at the data on this, um, it may not be the best solution for a number of reasons. Um, one, when you look at the impact on the number of transplants that are actually done with an opt-out system, um, the results are mixed. The impact is not clearly better from the change of the default policy. And that's largely because of the uncertainty revol revolving around what the deceased individual would have wanted and if they would have wanted to be registered. So the family's unsure of what the, the, the deceased individual would want. Um, alarmingly, there's a lot of ethical concerns, the ability to actually get informed consent, especially from vulnerable populations, and it's very costly in terms of time and money to change the default. And so what you see is a number of jurisdictions, almost every jurisdiction in North America continues to use the system that they're using where people have to sign up and register themselves. So, so how can we increase registrations within these systems if people are not changing systems, if jurisdictions aren't changing, and if this isn't the best solution, what can we do within the systems? Um, and when we look to prior research to, to look at how we can increase registrations, what you see is almost all of the work in this area has actually looked at changing the drivers of organ donation attitudes and intentions. Um, but attitudes and intentions don't seem to align very well with actual registrations. There's a lot of work showing that they don't correspond nicely. And so all this work on attitudes and intentions um, might not be as meaningful in terms of how to increase registrations. There's a very large um, intention action gap. So 90% of Americans support organ donation. Um, and these are current numbers. Only 60% are registered. In Canada, 90% support organ donation. 81% say they're willing to register. If you ask them their willingness to register, but we only see 32% of Canadians registered as organ donors. So what happens if we try to look at the papers then that have only looked at real donations? Well, the reality is there's actually very few of those. There's not many papers that have looked at increasing actual real organ donations. And those that have, um, have largely tested interventions that are very costly, labor intensive and difficult to scale. So things like town halls with expert panels with a lot of experts um, and people, which are just, it's difficult to increase um, organ donations on a national scale with something like that. Um, one exception is a really nice paper by Salas and colleagues where they looked at persuasive messages um, to increase donations, but this was done in an online context. Um, the majority of organ donor registrations actually happened in person, um, and it was tested outside of their standard registration process. So what we wanted to look at with this paper is really how can we increase registrations within the current prompted choice systems? How can we improve um, and help address this problem? And just to give you a really quick snapshot of what a prompted choice system looks like for those of you who aren't familiar with what this looks like, typically you're going to go to your Department of Motor Vehicles where you get your driver's license. They're going to give you a waiting number and you're going to sit. And if your DMV is anything like mine, you're going to wait and wait and wait some more. Eventually you're gonna go up to the counter. Um, they're going to have you do your transactions. They're gonna be filling out your driver's license work. And in the middle, they're gonna prompt you, would you like to register as an organ donor today? And if you say yes, they hand you a form, um, a lengthy form to complete. And once you've completed it, you're registered as a donor. What we wanted to look at is what can we do to improve registrations within the system? And so we looked specifically at whether we could use multiple elements of the marketing mix to improve organ donor registrations, both promotion elements as well as process elements. Um, could we motivate individuals to register by providing them information or um, reciprocal altruism, two features that have been found to affect um, attitudes and intentions if we deliver them at the right time? Um, and we wanted to pair these promotional materials with a streamlined registration process. So rather than giving individuals these promotional materials in the middle of their driver's license transaction, why not when people enter the center and they come in and they get that waiting number, why not at that point give them the organ donor registration form along with the promotional materials? This gives them time to review the materials. Um, we're also intercepting consumers at the time of decision making. So they're seeing that promotion right at the point in time when they have the form and can complete it. Um, and in addition, rather than using a lengthy form, why don't we simplify the process by which you can register? So what we did is we took the lengthy form in Ontario and we created a simplified organ donor registration form. It was about a half, this is the, the, the simplified form. It's about a half sheet, it's very small. We printed it on cardstock, so it was sturdy. You could complete it anywhere. Um, and we added a colorful banner to the top. And we really just focused on the two main questions you need to answer to register. And so this served as our control condition. Then we wanted to see above and beyond this control, these streamlined process, would our interventions have additional benefit 
So first we tested, for example, depending on the condition you were assigned to, you would get that simplified form along with an information brochure. Um, and we just used the standard brochure used in Ontario. So their information brochure on organ donation. And then we tested another, a, a few other conditions where on the simplified form in that colored banner that was blank in the control condition, we included some nudge statements um, where we tried to leverage feelings of reciprocity and altruism, um, drawing on theories of perspective taking, which is really helpful to get people to act, especially in pro-social contexts. Um, so things like if you needed a transplant, would you have one? If so, please help save lives and register today. Um, or imagine yourself in the situation. How would you feel if you couldn't get a transplant and you needed one? Or how would others feel? Um, and then we partnered with our, or with our government partners. We chose um, one of the largest, most demographically representative service centers in Ontario um, to test all of these different um, conditions, um, which had a relatively low share of registered donors. And we just looked at the number of new organ donor registrations on any given day. And we measured this before we started our experiment, during our experiment, as well as what happens after the experiment stops. Um, and we were looking at each of those five conditions, which were run for three consecutive days. Um, and any, basically any individual who completed a transaction at the center was a participant. So that gave us 3,300 participants um, during the field experiment. And so what do we find? Um, compared to the standard process, so the bar, the furthest bar on the left, um, that's the baseline of the center. All of our four interventions improved organ donor registrations, um, but we were really interested in what would happen above and beyond that control condition. That control condition also had the new form and the extra time. Um, would these additional nudges, this information or these um, reciprocal altruism nudge statements, would this lead to a further increase in registrations? Um, and across all of our models, whether it be the model free evidence, um, or we did a number of different models with different specifications, we find that the reciprocal altruism nudge, if you needed a transplant, would you have one, um, increased organ donor registrations the most. So from 4.1 in the control to 7.4 um, in, the, in the reciprocal altruism condition. So what are some of our takeaways from these findings? Um, First off, it's important to realize that a lot of times the problem is not just knowledge. If knowledge was the only problem, the information brochure, which provided people more information, that would have been the key driver of registrations. What we see here is there is a real action gap. And the intention action gap is not limited to organ donation. So this paper is stud studying organ donation, but we have intention action gaps in terms of a lot of us have the intentions to eat healthier and don't always act on it. Save more money, don't always act on it. There's a, there's a number of areas where we have good intentions and don't act. Um, and so it shows that providing the right message, the promotional messages at the right time can really have a, make a big difference in terms of getting people to take action and overcome those barriers of inaction. Um, another thing that we find is that it's really important to make it easy. Um, we paired all of our interventions with the simplified streamlined process, um, handing it out in advance, giving people time to process the materials. Um, another benefit of this is that we circumvented some of the variation in performance between customer service representatives. So one thing that's interesting in this context is different agents have different effectiveness in getting people to register. Some agents just get a lot of people to register, some don't. By giving everyone the format in advance, you circumvent this variation. Everyone gets to see it and have the opportunity to register, and it doesn't matter which counter you end up at. Um, Another really important finding is that you have to intercept customers at the right time. Um, we gave an information brochure um, that is commonly used by Service Ontario. It was always available in service kiosks. Um, it's mailed to everybody with their driver's license renewal, but we found it had a huge impact when it was given at the point in which people were filling out the form. So you can have the best material, but if you're not giving it at the right time, it won't have the biggest impact. So timing is key. Um, and big impact doesn't have to be costly. This whole experiment cost $3,000 to run, and that was largely um, a one-time cost of designing the form and printing the forms, which you wouldn't have to print the old form. So almost no cost. So leveraging behaviorally informed messages and design improvements, tracking your performance can make a huge impact. And in terms of better world outcomes, we saw a large increase in registrations in our study, but if it's introduced across Ontario, we would expect 225,000 new registrations annually, so every year, um, holding all else constant. In terms of emerging questions, um, we found really big impact in terms of registrations, but we weren't able to test the psychological process driving our um, mechanisms in the field. So we ran some post tests to try and get at what we think was going on with our interventions in the paper. Um, but it would be lovely to be able to actually test in the field, given that we know intentions and actions don't align in this context. 
Um, it also would be nice to test how important each component of our interventions was. How much did it matter that it was printed on cardstock that people could fill out anywhere or that colored banner was there? Um, or what would happen if we paired the nudge with the information? Would that overwhelm people or would that further enhance registrations? Um, so the impact of each individually would be a nice thing to examine as well. Um, and our work circumvented customer service agents, but could we find ways to enhance their ability given that they have, they have a strong ability to get people to register? Um, so I'll leave you now with those questions. Thank you so much and I look forward to our discussion. I'm here to present our work and um, we are very happy to be here. Uh, thanks to the organizers for the opportunity. And when I say our work, um, it's actually work by me, Andrea Weirau, uh, here at the University of Amsterdam and my wonderful co-author Su Chi Wang, uh, Stanford University is also in the audience and will join us later in the breakout rooms. And when thinking about <clears throat> what inspired us to, uh, to do work on this, I actually need to take you back in time. I will not uh, tell you how far back in time because that would reveal how long we've been working on this project. But when we were starting this, we were actually busy with another um, project together with uh, Daniela Kapoor and Michal Mimaran. And we were collaborating with UNICEF, trying to help school children in Panama improve their drinking behavior, moving them from sugary drinks to healthier options. So both Suchi and I were quite, let's say, focused on health education materials and nudges that were used by policymakers to lead people to healthier choices, drinking choices, food choices. And I think our entire project pretty much started with an observation that a lot of these materials that health, uh, health policy and education uses is making an interesting, um, yeah, let's say comparison and often portrays humans as machine-like. Um, there is an example here on the slide. This is an education uh, documentary by National Geographic uh, calling, called The Incredible Human Machine. And um, in these type of uh, yeah, visuals where humans are compared to or are portrayed as machines, there's often the idea that if you are um, uh, treating your body like a machine, you'd be better off health-wise, right? So in this documentary, for example, there's one episode where bad health, like bad food choices are literally marketed as errors to the human body system. And there's a couple more examples that we also um, show in, in, in the paper. Not only in health and food education, did we find out is that a thing? Um, also food marketing uses a similar association. Um, there's um, uh, one example here, Centrum, they're selling food supplements. Now we can dis discuss if that's a healthy or unhealthy choice, but for them, I would assume they promote it as the healthy choice. And they are also kind of saying, yeah, uh, if you are using these food supplements, you're thinking about your body, it's a empowering the human machine. Even stepping away, from educational materials or targeted advertisement, just thinking about how our world evolves, we notice that the idea that a human body or humans are more and more looking like machines is something that consumers might be exposed to in environments where they choose food. And it took me a while to bring this in, but on the bottom of the slide in the last um, column, you can see a picture of a waitress from the German Oktoberfest. Um, and what you see here is that she's wearing an exoskeleton. This is a cyborgistic product enhancing human power or strength, and it helps her to carry uh, beer mugs. And again, uh, there's an example where a human person is portrayed as somewhat more machine-like in a context where certainly we're making food or drink choices. Now, all of these observations kind of led us to um, a simple statement, which is like, oh, apparently consumers are exposed to this visual in which we are using the idea that a human is somewhat looking more machine-like. And we went back to um, our starting point, which was to remind you health and food education. And we kind of looked more deeply into what type of message is actually communicated here. And in a lot of cases, what it seems to be is uh, that policymakers follow quite a simple, let's say, chain of thoughts. A human body that, or human that looks more like a machine also should behave more like a machine. Right, that's kind of a simple, um, or very intuitive link. Whatever it means to be machine-like, though, can be very different. We uphold many associations about machines, but one very, very dominant one seems to be that compared to humans, 
they are much more cognition oriented, right? They're analytical, cold, they're good at math, they're rational. So many of us would not think about machines as being impulsive emotional decision makers. In food, we know that being cognition oriented, not being guided by emotion, many, many times leads to healthier choices, right? Stress leads to comfort food, being nervous about giving a big presentation might make you eat some chocolate. So all these types of emotional decisions are usually more unhealthy. So on a first level of intuition, it might not be wrong that policymakers believe that if you give the humans the cue that, look, you are looking a lot like a machine, making you think that you can or should behave more like a machine, that that in a food context and in food education materials might translate into better choices. However, we found out that that is nothing but an assumption. And that also led us to the core research question of our work, which is, does this actually um, work like that? If you show someone human body looks like a machine, does that trigger that expectation to also behave more like a machine, in this case, more cognition oriented and rational? And in the context of food choices in which we looked at this, the rational choice being the more healthy choice. Now, as with many, many other things in uh, human behavior, the answer uh, is it depends. And first and foremost, the link of the idea that if you make a human look more like a machine, it triggers an expectation to behave more like a machine. That's, uh, that um, we, show, we have empirical evidence to show that. That is not limited to our context. We know, for example, the reverse mechanism in anthropomorphism literature, a machine that is made to look more like human. People also expect that machine to be more like human. And we were able to show that that also holds in the other direction. However, when it comes to how this expectation that is triggered translates to food choices, we were able to show that it highly depends on consumer segment. For one consumer segment, which is people high in health self-efficacy, self those are people who are in general already quite good in making health choices. For those, um, exposure to such stimuli actually has the intended effect. And that is because if you are someone who is already quite confident about making good food choices, and I'm giving you a trigger that um, raises the expectation in you to uh, behave rational towards food like a machine, you can meet that, you believe that you can meet that, it, meet that and it's a, it has a motivating, um, um, it has a motivating um, effect on you. So for those folks, it works exactly as policymakers policy probably hope for. However, and more importantly, if you're someone who is low in health at self-efficacy, being a person that generally struggles with your ability to make good choices. And I'm exposing a person like that to, it, to the idea that, yes, you should be a rational machine-like uh, decision maker. What we show is that they feel that they cannot meet that expectation. And not only does that lead them not to make healthier decisions, but even worse, it leads to a so-called backfire effect. And that in food has been shown before. It, um, there's two mechanisms that contribute to that. First and foremost, knowing that you're exposed to an expectation that you cannot meet is not particularly good for your self-esteem. And many people respond to threats to their self-esteem with comfort food, and that's mostly unhealthy. But also being exposed to an expectation that you cannot meet um, actually uh, triggers aggression towards yourself, but also towards the person that is exposing you to that expectation that is un, uh, in, that you're unable to meet, unable to meet. And that kind of aggression translates into reactance, and reactance in this context is also the unhealthier food choice. So why does that, why is that important? Well, as you can see with my wonderfully chosen images here. Um, the uh, uh, slightly overweight guy on the lower part of the slide is probably the person that would need some support and um, uh, policies to help him or her make the, um, make the healthier choice. So in that sense, it's particularly um, worrisome 
that um, this vulnerable segment might actually backfire to an um, exposure uh, to a stimulus that is meant to increase healthy choices. Now, um, we've tested this, um, let's say, effect and, and the moderation in a number of studies. Of course, I don't have time to go through them. I just wanted to quickly um, introduce uh, the variety of study types and samples that we looked at. We have um, run several experiments online and in the lab. We did a field study um, with samples from the UK, the US, the Netherlands. We developed and tested this with a number of different uh, stimuli that portray humans as machines, some a bit more closer to food and showing the digestive systems, others that are a bit more closer to the technological examples that you've shown, I've shown you. And we also looked at a number of different food choices. Um, and to kind of wrap up the, the, the key results, indeed, it seems that the idea of policymakers to use this human as machine stimulus or representation to encourage people to act more machine-like and make healthier choices is only beneficial for part of the consumer segment, in particular people who are high in eating self-efficacy, but for many, especially those who are low in eating self-efficacy, it actually leads to unhealthier choices due to the fact... Well, sorry. <laughs> due to the fact that um, uh, uh, they cannot meet that expectation. So uh, in the end, um, we uh, really rang a cautionary bell to these policymakers um, who wanted to improve health using these um, stimuli. This, the segment that they actually want to help is not the segment that they're reaching. Uh, on the contrary, it actually has an adverse effect on them. And this kind of backs up previous research as expectations and kind of activating them is something that needs to be done with a lot of care, taking in con into consideration people's ability to meet them. We have a small bit of hope because we do show that within a certain intervention, you can booster one's perceived ability to meet the expectation. We show that in a, a field setting. Um, so in general, you can still use these stimuli if you, uh, yeah, if you accompany them with, uh, with boosters. But if you had to make a hard choice, it's probably wise uh, to use them with a lot of care. Now, leading to um, my last uh, slide, a uh, couple emerging research questions. The idea of portraying humans as machines, of course, has, is a quite an open research field. So I'll focus on a couple that fit into the better marketing for a better world outlook. Um, and I think a couple things that would be interested is interesting is, of course, first and foremost, to look at different domains. We started with health education, but financial decision making, medical decision making, um, could also be interested to, to be checked. And I'm particularly thinking about linking to some of the earlier speakers' work. If you think about using a visual or exposing people to themselves or others in a more machine-like way, I'm wondering how that would affect social behavior, such as donation, donating your organs to others or donating money to charity. Um, there's also um, an interesting element um, about the idea that humans that look more, more like machines might be looked as, as indeed less human and therefore could be objectified and that could be particularly interested to look in a perspective in, for factory workers that work uh, wear exoskeleton or the waitress that I was showing you. Um, there's two other things that I think could be interesting. Um, of course, we looked at machines that look like humans, previous work that looked at humans that look more like machines. But in the end, there's also a lot of uh, space in the gray area uh, for agents that we can no longer distinguish. Um, humanoid robots where you don't know what you expect. Um, and I think there's a couple interesting um, questions around that. And last but not least, the theory that we're using is not just speaking about humans to look more like machines, but also to look more like animals, um, which I think is a fantastic way to end the presentation, me as an um, ape. And the entire area of animalistic dehumanization is also something that still uh, is very open to be researched. So that's all I have for now. Thank you very much for your attention. Looking forward to the breakout rooms.